Good morning. Good morning, Bonnie. <laughs> now, I think some people use the alarm as an excuse to go to breakfast early. I think that's what's happened here. But you, the faithful elect, the remnant of Israel, have made it. So I appreciate that. And we're going to continue undaunted. We are in uh, Acts chapter 22. I have a little less uh, maneuvering room down here, so I'm hoping I don't trip over the steps. But uh, Acts chapter 22, you'll recall, last week we uh, were tracing the story of Paul as he's now arrived in Jerusalem at the conclusion of his third missionary journey. Uh, He's been warned, of course, repeatedly on the way that uh, difficulties will await him when he arrives in Jerusalem, but he's unwilling to be deterred by that. He comes to the city, uh, his old hometown, the place where he grew up, the place where he was educated, and he comes back now. And this, in some ways, represents the culmination of his whole career. He has, we at least uh, suspect, been looking forward to the opportunity to present the gospel now. Mid-career, you might say, here in Jerusalem, this, uh, this great center of the Jewish faith, which was, of course, his own, and also now the great center of the Christian faith. And so all of that is in his mind as he comes and His first contact is with the uh, Christian leadership, uh, James, the pastor, along with what appears to be the session of the church in Jerusalem. They warmly receive him. They hear from him the account of the way in which God has been blessing through his ministry on these uh, excursions he's had through the ancient world. And then they also tell him that, Paul, there's a little bit of a storm brewing right here in Jerusalem. Paul, of course, was aware of that, but James nevertheless tells him that the word on the street concerning Paul was that he was out there telling people around the world that, uh, especially Jewish people, that they should abandon Moses. I'm uh, going to, since it looks like we're going to be able to stay for a while, get down to business here. Um, And so uh, Paul, of course, was not saying anything of the kind. He wasn't going around telling Jewish people to abandon Moses. He was warning them that through simple keeping of the law, there is no guarantee of salvation. Uh, That was as close to the mark as this rumor was getting. But nevertheless, it was being distorted. It was being overstated. And James, therefore, hatches this strategy that he hopes will shut the mouths of the critics and suggest that Paul should join in an oath that's being taken, a Nazarite vow, a Jewish ritual vow, And by so doing, by joining with these men who had taken that vow themselves, and by paying their expenses, possibly Paul would be able to escape this misunderstanding that was afoot. And Paul, of course, agrees to do that. And while he's in the uh, temple discharging some of the duties related to that vow, somebody from Ephesus, a Jewish person who was there from Ephesus and presumably recognized Paul as the man who had been so instrumental there in Ephesus in the growth of the gospel, uh, seizes upon Paul, calls the other people around to assist in grabbing Paul, drag him out of the temple, and they begin pounding on him. And it's at that point, of course, that the Roman soldiers come down from what's called the Antonia, that is that castle, a kind of Roman barracks there, not too far from the temple. They, in a sense, rescue Paul from the crowd, although it may be... uh, uh, to treat him to something even worse. Uh, but in the, in, in the uh, process of taking him back, then he pleads with the, uh, the uh, Roman commander there for the opportunity to address the crowd. And so we're just in the beginning of this address. Uh, we looked at the first few verses of it last week. Uh, Paul introduces himself to these people. He tells them he's a Jew. He was born in Tarsus, but he was raised here in Jerusalem. He went to the school of Gamaliel which is a highly respected institution. All of his pedigree is uh, impeccable, unimpeachable. And so all of this is designed, in a good sense of the word, to ingratiate himself to these, this rowdy crowd there in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, so Paul makes this uh, 
statement to them. He points out that he shared with them at one point the same passion that was contrary, that was hostile to the Christian movement. He persecuted that way, he says, even to the point of death. It was in that context that he was on his way to Damascus with papers authorizing him to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem these people who were attached to the name of Christ. And that's as far as we got last week. So we're going to pick up then uh, Paul's address to the Jerusalem crowd. This is verse 6 then of uh, Acts chapter 22. And again, if you have the Pew Bible, it's page 143. Otherwise, follow along in your own text, uh, beginning at verse 6. While I was on my way and approaching Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? Then he answered me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I asked, What am I to do, Lord? The Lord said, get up and go to Damascus. There you'll be told everything that's been assigned to you to do. Since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, those who were with me took me by the hand and led me to Damascus. A certain Ananias, who was a devout man according to the law and well spoken of by all the Jews living there, came to me. And standing beside me, he said, Brother Saul, Regain your sight. In that very hour, I regained my sight and saw him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear his own voice. For you will be his witness to all the world of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, have your sins washed away, calling on his name. After I had returned to Jerusalem and and, and while I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw Jesus saying to me, Hurry, get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And while the blood of your witness Stephen was shed, I myself was standing by approving and keeping the coats of who of those who killed him? Then he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this point, they listened to him, but then they shouted, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And while they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust in the air, the tribune directed that he be brought into the barracks and ordered him to be examined by flogging to find out how the, or to find out the reason for this outcry against him. But when they had tied him up with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? Then the centurion, or when the centurion heard that, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? This man's a Roman citizen. The tribune came and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, it cost me a lot of money to get my citizenship. Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Immediately, those who were about to examine him drew back from him. And the tribune also was afraid because he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. We'll stop right there and uh, take that much of the uh, text this morning. Let's just ask God's blessing on our discussion. Father, we're grateful that you give us this continuing insight into the unfolding drama of this great apostle. We thank you that through him we see the grace of Jesus Christ poured out. And it's that same grace which brings us here this morning to reflect on that story and to be similarly encouraged and inspired by the things we find here. We pray that our discussion would honor Christ, and we ask these things in his name. Amen. 
All right, so we're back at uh, verse 6 then of uh, chapter 22. While I was on my way and approaching Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me. I mentioned this uh, last week. This account of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is one of three that Luke includes in his book of Acts. Uh, There are several different sets of three in Acts. This is one of them. Uh, Three accounts of Paul's conversion. The reason he does it three times, as we were suggesting at the end of our conversation last week, was because this is really one of the great inexplicable events of ancient history. How could Paul, who was the greatest champion of all of those who wanted to destroy the Christian faith, become almost overnight the greatest champion on behalf of the Christian faith? How does that happen exactly? That a person just has a reversal that is so striking. And as a historical fact, we know something like that happened. We know there was a guy named Paul. We know that, uh, you know, he was reared in the Jewish tradition and that somehow or other this huge, inexplicable uh, reversal took place. I know people have tried to explain it psychologically. You know, Paul had a stroke on the way to Damascus. Well, in a sense, he did, I guess. Uh, he had a, he was seized with guilt over what he was doing, you know, that sort of thing. But All of those uh, attempts rather naturalistically to explain this really fall short of the mark, really don't quite get at it. Paul was a man who, without any question, was one of the great geniuses of the ancient world. Uh, The product of his writing talents that we have in the New Testament all by themselves distinguish him as one of the great thinkers. And we just realize something profound happened, something real happened to him. And uh, Luke knows that, and he doesn't want us to miss it, and so he keeps reminding us of this. And it becomes part of this story he wants to impress upon us, of the way in which this man was touched by grace and became this great figure. And it legitimizes Paul, because that, of course, is the main thing, or at least one of the things that Luke is about here. So again, we have the story. He was on his way to Damascus. About noon, this light shone suddenly about him. Paul, as we would absolutely expect, fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Back in chapter 9, the first time we hear this story, uh, the little detail is added that the, 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 the voice spoke to Paul in the Hebrew language, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? reaching right down to the core, you see, of Paul's identity, this sense in which God calls us by name. This is not just, hey, you, you know, Saul. And he hears his name. And why are you persecuting me? Uh, That's an intriguing statement, isn't it? We would have expected Jesus to say, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting my church, you see? But uh, there's something very deep about that. Why are you persecuting me? Uh, And it speaks to the issue that in the New Testament there is this deep connection, this intimate relationship between Christ and his people. We're called the body of Christ. The New Testament teaches us that we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but is tested and was tested at every point just as we are yet without sin. That's part of what qualifies him for that task of representing us in our needs before the throne of God. He, in a sense, walks in our shoes with us. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. When you stub your toe, in a sense, Christ stubs his toe. When you feel pain, Christ feels pain. He's touched with those feelings. And when his church was persecuted, it was actually a persecution of Christ himself. We are said to be in Christ, and Christ is in us. And the reason that's significant in the New Testament is because that means that Christ can authentically represent to God the great source of grace, precisely our need, because he is there in between, as it were, the high priest. He represents our need because he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities, and yet being very God, he can be right there in the presence of God to represent that. And he obtains, as it were, from God grace to help in time of need. So we're told boldly that we should go, you know, we we are told in the New Testament to go boldly to the throne of grace and obtain grace to help in time of need. So what are you going through? Is there a Saul of Tarsus that's, uh, you know, troubling you? 
and you're feeling the pain or the anxiety or the difficulty, well, whatever it is, Christ is feeling that with you and obtaining for you at this very moment what you need, exactly what you need. But in a sense, that means that when you go through these things, Christ goes through them. Paul, why are you persecuting me? You know. Paul's response here, Who are you, Lord? Then he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Can you just imagine Paul. You know, there's no name that he despises more than the name Jesus of Nazareth. There's no name that he hates more than that one. There's no name he would rather you know, just wipe off the face of human history than the name Jesus of Nazareth. Anybody that's attached to the name Jesus of Nazareth, he wants to do them in. This is his single passion in life, is to do whatever he can to destroy the name Jesus of Nazareth. He's on the way to Damascus, and all of a sudden somebody shows up and says, Oh, Paul, excuse me, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jesus of Nazareth. What do you go through when you have a uh, moment like that? And Paul is confronted now with the one that uh, he was trying so desperately to uh, destroy. What kind of shock would it be? And he's stunned into silence here. I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Paul says, now those who were with me saw the light but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. It's a little bit of an inconsistency. If you go back and read the version in chapter 9, the first account of uh, Paul's conversion, what it says there is, uh, those who were with me uh, saw no man. Here it says they saw the light. In the earlier version, it says, uh, here it says they did not hear the voice, There it says they did hear a sound. Many people have kind of seized on that. You see, a little inconsistency. They want to suggest that, you know, this is getting all the mileage they can out of this. You see, the Bible disagrees with itself. Even Luke can't get his story straight, that that sort of thing. Well, I don't think so. I think, you know, you look at this, it's not any inconsistency. If anything, it sort of argues for the accuracy of Luke. Luke is a bright enough guy to know that he's given a little bit of a variant account here. He really has a passion for detail. We've seen that all along. Dr. Luke, you know, he's, he's always uh, going out of his way to make sure he gets the, all the little microscopic points of the story just right. And uh, so he certainly knew that what he was saying here, reporting as Paul's version of this account, is a little different than he, what he himself had said back in chapter 9. If anything, that argues for Luke's accuracy, that he himself would let that little inconsistency hang there without trying to harmonize it, you see. He doesn't do that. But even if you look at this alleged inconsistency, it isn't. You know, here we have uh, that uh, the statement is that uh, they saw the light. Earlier it was they didn't see a man, so they saw a light. Uh, they uh, heard a voice. Uh, in, earlier they, uh, they heard a sound. They didn't hear the voice. The reason Paul mentions this, the reason Paul is, uh, wants to emphasize that those who were with him actually experienced something of this themselves is simply to make it clear that this was not some kind of just private hallucination on the part of Paul. It wasn't like they were all going to Damascus and Paul had this seizure and everybody was standing around wondering what's wrong with Paul. It wasn't that sort of thing at all. Everybody knew something had just happened. They all had an experience that was out there in the objective world of real phenomena. Now, they didn't know exactly what it was. They didn't hear this voice articulating words. They didn't see a person. They saw the bright light. They heard the sound, probably like thunder. But for Paul alone, you know, the real content of this came through. But this isn't uh, Paul, you know, just having some kind of private experience that others were unaware was, uh, you know, happening at the time. That's important for Paul because he really maintains this was a return visit of Jesus of Nazareth. This was Jesus returning to earth to have a private consultation with Paul, but it was a big enough deal that those who were around were aware, you know, something was happening. And so he uh, reports that. And the implication is, 
you know, that these people who were with me on the road to Damascus probably are still around. If you don't, you know, buy my story, go check with them. They'll concur. There was this extraordinary event that took place on the road to Damascus. You've got to account for that somehow, you see. So that's sort of the, the notion that Paul's uh, developing here. Verse 10, I asked, what am I to do, Lord? The Lord said to me, get up and go to Damascus, and there it will be told you everything that's been assigned to you to do. So Paul's response here is perfectly appropriate. What should I do? He's told to go to Damascus. He is not told the full sweep of all that his life is going to entail from this point on. He's not told, Paul, you're going to become the great Apostle Paul, and 2,000 years from now, people are still going to be studying your story and reading your writings. Well, you know, he's not told any of that. He's not told the great sweep of what his life is going to involve. He's simply told, here's the next step to take. Put one foot in front of the other and go to Damascus, you see. Uh, and one step at a time, one day at a time, I'm going to show you what your life is going to be about. Now, again, if I can just be a little practical here. This is the way God is with us. Uh, God rarely, and I say this is very good for us, rarely ever shows us the big picture. <laughs> you know, we couldn't bear it, probably. He always just shows us a little bit. God will probably not show you what obedience demands of you next year, you know. He probably won't mention to you what you need to do in obedience to him, you know, six months from now. But he will certainly show you what you need to do in obedience to him today. And that's all we need, isn't it? Just one day at a time. Don't worry so much about tomorrow. It'll take care of itself, Jesus says. The main thing we need to be concerned about is today. What do I do today? Paul, go to Damascus today. Whatever God is calling you to do today, you know it. Now, don't worry about next week, next year, five years from now. You can worry about that when the time comes. At this point, Paul is told, go to Damascus. There you will be told what you must do. Verse 11, since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, those who were with me took me by the hand and led me to Damascus. This is, again, a little bit of gentle irony. Paul's intent had been to go to Damascus and take people, as it were, by the hand back to Jerusalem. He thought he saw very clearly, but in fact he was blind as he was passionately driven to go to Damascus. Now he's been reduced to a blind man, but he sees clearly for the first time. Now, rather than, being, than leading people by the hand, He's in the place of those he was pursuing and is, in fact, being led by the hand. And God says, yo, you, want to, you, know, you like this arrangement? Let me lead you, Paul, to Damascus, a blind man. And Paul is put right you know, immediately into the shoes of those that were the targets of his wrath, taken into Damascus uh, in, uh, in this kind of uh, almost bondage in his blindness. What blinded him? The uh, description here, I could not see because of the brightness of the light. This is a perfect time, isn't it, to mention that, because Woody just preached a brilliant sermon this morning. And I'm, I'm going to try my very best not to steal any of his thunder, because, of course, some of you haven't heard this sermon yet, and so I have to tread very carefully here. But the sermon is on the glory of God, the glory of God. And actually, I tell you the truth, I was going to say this anyway. I promise it was, I was going to say it. <clears throat> the glory of God is, in the Old Testament, this word kabod, it means weight. And really throughout the scriptures, that notion of weight and light are combined in this remarkable idea of God's glory. We see it again and again. It has an intimate connection to the holy. Last week we were talking about the holy, you may recall. The, 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 they are intimately related, virtually the same thing. The distinction between the holy and the glory is simply this. The holy is descriptive of the fundamental character of God. The glory is the experience when that holy is disclosed. I heard one uh, theologian describe it once as glory is holiness with the lid off. You like that? 
I like that one better than another description I heard once, which was glory is the incandescent ectoplasm of God's invisible spirit. <laughs> nah, I don't like that one. <clears throat> that sounds like something from Star Trek, you know, but, uh, but I do like the first one. And that's what it is. The holy manifesting itself, pouring out, is glory, you see. So in Isaiah we hear, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of His glory. Those words frequently, almost unavoidably, come together. And so when you think glory, think holiness. And here, the reason Paul had this crushing experience, blinding him, disabling him, reducing him now to a dependent person, one who was so powerful and proud and full of you know, what he thought was righteous indignation against Christ and his followers, the thing that put him in his place was this disclosure of the brightness, the glory of God that just knocks him literally off his saddle, you know. And uh, so there he is. Verse 12, A certain Ananias, who was a devout man according to the law and well spoken of by all the Jews living there, came to me. And standing beside me, he said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. In that very hour, I regained my sight and saw him. Uh, Again, this is another little uh, variant account, certainly not inconsistent, but Luke here is not telling us the other little piece of the story that we get in chapter 9. In chapter 9, we hear something of of, uh, God coming to Ananias. And, uh, you know, Paul's uh, instruction was to go to Damascus. That was the instruction for Paul that day. At the same time, the instruction for Ananias was to go to Paul, go to Saul of Tarsus. Ananias wasn't so thrilled at that prospect, as you recall. Uh, He said, wait, we'll hold the phone here. I've heard of this guy. Uh, The reason he came to Damascus was to arrest people like me. You know, I'm the person he's after. Uh, He's come with papers to arrest me and take me to Jerusalem. And you want me to go to him? Come again? You know, that's sort of Ananias' response to that. And, of course, uh, Jesus gives him, uh, you know, instruction. Just do it. This may not make sense to you right now, but the word of obedience for you is just go. Just give him the gospel. Paul doesn't include that here. Paul is telling the story from Paul's point of view as he's giving the uh, account, you see, to this Jerusalem crowd, so that little piece of it doesn't uh, work its way in. All he knows is he was sitting there in in the darkness of this blindness. He'd been three days fasting, wondering, contemplating, what does this all mean? And then the silence is broken by a voice. And all he says is a certain Ananias came to me and said, Brother Saul. And again, that's such a touching moment in Christian history. Ananias knew that this was the man who would have loved to see Ananias put to death. And yet he can go in the power of God's grace and say to such a man, Brother Saul. You see, the effect of the gospel is to make lions lie down with lambs. The effect of the gospel is to bring peace where there was intractable warfare. That's what the gospel does. That's why Christ is called the Prince of Peace. And I tell you, this planet will never know peace, never, until it knows it under the power of the Prince of Peace. You know, this Christmas season, all of our carols, virtually every one of them, celebrates some aspect of the fact that Christ is the great King of Peace. And we should think about that as we hear it. Here was a very unlikely brotherhood between Ananias and Saul. Brother Saul, regain your sight. In that very hour, I regained my sight and saw him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear his own voice. Ananias tells Paul something now, and here we have information that was not included back in chapter 9. So again, there's, there's you know, variation of the story here. No inconsistency, but just different information is included. At this point, we hear something of what Ananias said to Saul. And he says there's three things God has chosen you for. To know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear his voice. Now, the last two of those probably refer to the Damascus Road. <clears throat> 
And the reason that's important, and the reason Paul wants to make a point out of including it, is because it was again important that Paul actually saw the righteous one and heard his voice. This was not simply a missionary coming to Paul and giving him the gospel. You know, Philip spoke the gospel to the, to the Ethiopian eunuch and the man was converted. But that was not a personal visitation there by Christ. You know, it was certainly the word of Christ and the grace of Christ and the presence of Christ in some sense through that preached word. But Paul says, no, no, this is something different. This was Christ right here, back in human history. And the reason for Paul that that was so important is because he not only viewed this as the moment of his conversion, but it also was the moment of his commissioning as an apostle. From the New Testament point of view, an apostle could only become an apostle by a direct and immediate commissioning by Christ himself. Christ creates apostles. Apostles do not create apostles. This, by the way, is a point of dispute between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, and I am advocating now, candidly, the Protestant perspective, because I believe it's right, you know. And that is this, that Christ is the one who can say, he who hears you, hears me. And the apostle could rightly carry that sort of weight and that kind of authority. When Paul said, Paul, an apostle... He was saying, in effect, the word that I speak to you now needs to be received by you as if it were the word of Christ himself. That's apostolic authority. You know. I, by the way, don't have apostolic authority. I'm a Sunday school teacher. That's not the same thing. If I ever come to this class on a Sunday morning and say, oh, by the way, everybody, he who hears me hears Christ, then you have my permission in advance you know, to throw me out the nearest window. At that point, I am trying to arrogate to myself authority I don't rightly own. All I can do is say, this is what the book says as best as I can tell. Now you go home and check it out. And that's about, as, that's about the extent of it right there, you see. Uh, and, uh, but when Paul speaks, if Paul shows up, then he can rightly say that. But the only way Paul could rightly claim to be an apostle would be if he could also claim that on a certain day at a certain time, there was actually a direct and immediate contact between Christ himself and Paul. So therefore, Paul has to insist that he saw the righteous one and heard his voice. You see, that's how important that is uh, in Paul's own understanding of his call. The other detail that Ananias includes here is that Paul was also to know his will. Now, that's related to Paul's apostleship, but it is a little bit of a different aspect of it. Paul understood that he had a unique role, a unique status as an apostle. He understood that he was not an apostle in quite the same sense as the others were. And in fact, he makes that distinction. He'll say, he'll say of himself that he was the apostle to the Gentiles, whereas Peter and the others were the apostles to the Jews. That's the distinction he makes, for example, in Galatians chapter 2 and elsewhere. Of Romans chapter 11. And so the, uh, that, that's very clearly in Paul's mind. Now that understanding of knowing God's will, of having that distinct status as an apostle, is probably related to the, the, the idea that the will of God in view here is what Paul otherwise calls a mystery. A mystery. So Paul makes quite a deal out of his writing to the fact that he understood and was given some insight into the will of God which was otherwise a mystery. Now, when he says mystery, he doesn't mean a whodunit mystery, like the butler did it kind of thing, but he means a mystery in the biblical sense, which is something that was once hidden and concealed, but now in the New Covenant era has been made clear, you see, has been disclosed. The preeminent mystery that Paul is concerned about in the New Testament has to do with the Gentiles. A great deal of uh, the New Testament message was certainly anticipated in the Old. The fact that Messiah would come was manifestly part of the Old Testament message. The fact that Messiah would suffer was clearly taught in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. Even the fact that Messiah would die and rise again is argued from the New Testament point of view as the implied content of Psalm 16. But that the Gentiles 
would actually come into the household of Israel. That they would become fellow citizens of the commonwealth of Israel by faith. That was not very clear from the Old Testament. You see, That was pretty obscure. Certainly that the gospel would go to the Gentiles, Isaiah and others make that point very clearly, but that they would actually come in as members in good standing, on equal footing with the Jewish community, that, you see, was a huge surprise. It was a mystery. And Paul was, was more than anybody else in the New Testament, the one that was the trustee of that mystery. It was entrusted to him. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. It's why he was in so much trouble all the time. It's why the book of Acts was written, you see, to defend that single uh, aspect of Paul's ministry more than any other. If you don't mind me just laboring this a little longer, uh, if you, if you uh, have your Bible open and would skip over briefly to Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul later now in his career, when he's in Rome in prison, writes back to the Ephesian Christians, the first three chapters of Ephesians are principally about this point. And he sort of reaches the punchline in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 1 and following. So just listen to what he says here. This is, by the way, page 193, if you're in the Pew Bible. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to what he says. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. You Ephesians, you Gentiles. I'm a prisoner for the sake of this that I've been discussing because of you Gentiles. For surely you've already heard of the commission of God's grace, the apostolic commission of God's grace that was given me for you, Gentiles, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote about in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind as it's now been revealed by the holy apostles and prophets through the Spirit. That is, here it is, to wit, the following is the mystery. What is it, Paul? Or bated breath? Out with it, what is it? The Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's it. And there was nobody more than Paul who was the one who was commissioned to preach that message. Same idea if you just look back to verse 11 of the preceding chapter. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision. Remember verse 12 that you were at that time without Christ, without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, stranger to the covenants of promise, But now in Christ, you who were far off have been made near. You've been made fellow citizens of Israel. You've become, as it were, Jewish by faith. So that's the other little piece of that. God had chosen Paul to know his will, that will of God in particular, that mystery, to be commissioned by him. And then if you look at uh, uh, verse 15... For you will be his witness to all the world, especially the Gentile world, of what you've seen and heard. And now why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. And so Paul, of course, in happy obedience to this instruction from Ananias, uh, submits to the external sacrament of baptism, which is reflective of and organically related to the internal baptism and regeneration that had already occurred in his heart even at that point. All right, verse 17. After I had returned to Jerusalem and while I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw Jesus saying to me, hurry, get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Now, this is three years later. Paul, continuing his account, he was in Damascus three years. We know that in the book of Galatians. Part of that time he spent in Arabia, probably almost kind of a parallel between Paul and Christ. Christ goes into the wilderness 
for 40 days and 40 nights. Some have speculated Paul went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. So he doesn't ever say that. That's speculation. But there is some kind of parallel. Then he spends time in Damascus. Now he comes back to Jerusalem. Here in Jerusalem, of course, he's not exactly welcomed with open arms. These Jewish Christians are a little suspicious, a little reticent to recognize Paul as truly a Christian. They think this is some kind of trick, you know. But Barnabas is the one who steps into the breach, the liaison between Paul on the one hand and the Christian leadership on the other. Eventually, uh, within a few days, Peter and the others recognize the legit- legitimacy of Paul's conversion and his apostleship. They give him the right hand of fellowship. All of that Paul tells us in Galatians. Now, I think what Paul indeed intended now, his plan here in Jerusalem at this time, was to go back and visit with some of those people with whom he had once hobnobbed, you know. The Jewish leadership, the scribes, the Pharisees, these were his buddies. These are the people that he hung out with back when he was a zealous persecutor of the church. He was a a distinguished individual. He was well-known. He had high credibility. His uh, credentials were unimpeachable. And he thought if there's anybody who could go and talk to these people, it would be me. I'm the one. I should say it would be I. You English teachers, I know that. Okay. It would be I who should go and... Predicate nominative. Always take the verbs of being, take the nominative. Okay. So, uh, it, 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 I'm the one that should go and talk to these people, because who in the world is more likely to persuade them of the truth of the gospel than I am? They know me. I was one of them. So if anybody could explain this, I'm the one who could do it. I can just imagine the conversation. Goes to the high priest. Hey, you know, you remember those letters of authority you gave me to go to Damascus and arrest Christian people and bring them back here? Funny thing happened to me on the way to Damascus. You mind if I tell you about it? You know, uh, I just so happens that I met Jesus of Nazareth, the very one I was trying to exterminate from the face of the planet. And uh, yeah, it's for it's for reals, <laughs> you know. And I, I think Paul probably thought he could get through to these people if he had that opportunity, and that's probably what he had in mind. So he's there in the temple thinking about this, praying about it, speculating on the possibility of being a witness to those who had once been his buddies there in the Jewish leadership. And it's in that context then that he has this visitation, a vision from Christ himself, in which he's told, hurry, get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony. Now, Paul objects here. Notice what he says. Lord, wait a minute. Why won't they accept my testimony? They know who I am. Verse 19, they themselves know that in every synagogue, I'm the one that imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. They know that I'm the one who was present when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was shed. I've got so much credibility with these people. They know how passionately devoted I was to destroying the church. If anybody can persuade them of the truth of the gospel, I'm the one who can do it. Come on, just let me give me a chance here. Jesus says, no, they will not accept it. You see, it reminds me of what Jesus says otherwise. If they don't believe the Bible, they won't believe if someone even comes back from the dead. They wouldn't believe Paul, no matter how much credibility he laid on the table, unless their hearts were converted by God's grace. And at least apparently at this time, it was not God's time to do such a thing. And so he's commanded, go, I have sent you far away to the Gentiles. What's interesting, of course, is that this mob here in Jerusalem had been willing to take everything that Paul was saying up to this point. You know, I mean, there are a lot of things Paul said that could have provoked a reaction, and they kept listening until Paul said the magic word, Gentiles. <laughs> that was, pushed them over the edge, you see. That was the thing they could not abide. That was the single most bitter aspect of the person of Paul, this commitment to the Gentiles, to us, for the most part, I assume, in this room. Uh, to us, that the gospel was indeed for us. So verse 22, up to this point, they listened to him, but then they shouted, away with such a fellow from the earth, he should not be allowed to live. And while they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust in the air, the tribune directed that he should be brought into the barracks and ordered him to be examined. Now what was happening when they were throwing dust in the air and taking off their cloaks, this was warm-ups for stoning Paul. They were going to stone Paul right there in front of the Roman soldiers. 
you know, which was not a smart thing to do, but that's how whipped up into a frenzy they were. Paul had made them so angry that they were prepared to risk their own lives for the sake of getting rid of Paul, and that was their intention, taking off their cloaks. This was kind of getting ready for that uh, uh, stoning, and, of course, the tribune wasn't prepared to permit that. So he directed that Paul be taken into the barracks, ordered him to be examined by flogging to find out the reason for this outcry against him. The Romans didn't have a really well-developed idea of due process for anybody but a Roman citizen. And in this case, uh, the idea was, and they really believed, in fact, it's part of the uh, uh, Roman law, that uh, you could only take the deposition of a slave under torture. It was just assumed that nobody would speak the truth, especially uh, slaves, which was more than half the population of the ancient world, unless they were being tortured at the time. That also applied to many others, and so the, the assumption was to get the truth out of this guy, we're going to start flogging him. Paul had never been through this kind of flogging. He'd been caned, as it were, in Philippi and maybe elsewhere. But here, uh, this was the classic Roman flogging. This was what Jesus was treated to before the crucifixion. It was the multi-stranded whip that had embedded metal and stuff in it, and it would just rip off layers of a person's flesh. So it was, uh, people would be impaired for life or killed by a flogging, and Paul wasn't really uh, thrilled at the prospect of this. And so uh, he invokes a little of his own... Uh, legal training at this point, and, and ask the question, just curious, um, just, oh, you who, uh, centurion, uh, is it okay to flog someone that's a Roman citizen? You know, and the centurion, uh, of course, uh, hears that uh, in, with uh, thundering clarity. So uh, the centurion goes to the tribune, the Chiliarch, who we name, learn later, his name is Lysias, and says, whoa, hold the phone, what are you about to do here? This man is a Roman citizen. Uh, the tribune came and asked Paul, you know, to confirm that. The tribune said, it cost me a large sum of money to get my citizenship. The implication of that was this. Most people became citizens, and in fact, we know this for a fact, most people became citizens either by paying large sums of money, and in modern terms, that would be like six digits. There's a huge amount of money that would be required uh, to become a Roman citizen, or... They were in a family, a patrician family, an aristocratic family, uh, and you would become kind of a patrician family, as it were, by this time in Roman history, uh, because your family had paid large money at some time or done great service on behalf of Rome. And then once your family was established as a, as a citizen family, anyone born into that family had citizenship by birth, you see. So you either had to buy it yourself and kind of inaugurate your status by that means, or be born into a family where that status was already established. There was no formal difference between those two, but there was an informal prestige that was associated with having been born into a family that was already a uh, citizen uh, family. And so that's why you have this little interplay here. Paul says, but I was born a citizen. Uh, immediately, those who were about to examine him drew back from him. The tribune also was afraid because, in fact, for Roman citizens, it was, uh, it was illegal, and, in fact, it was a serious crime to even bind a Roman citizen without due process. And so the uh, Chiliarch himself was uh, somewhat concerned uh, that he might be, you know, have his feet put to the fire for what he had done already. Well, this leads us up now to the first of three trials that Paul is going to undergo, and we'll save that discussion for next week. But uh, the first trial is before the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, and uh, that's what comes up in the next uh, chapter 23. From there, he'll be tried before Felix, and from there, he'll be tried before Agrippa. Three trials, exonerated in each case, and that becomes the great uh, conclusion of this book uh, that act, uh, of Acts in which Paul himself and his message are being uh, vindicated. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this story as it unfolds. We thank you for the great apostle, for those things we learn through him. We thank you that that same glory that turned the course of his life is, in some sense or other, the glory that has reversed the course of the life of any of us who have been touched by your grace. Give us eyes to see that glory in some way or other. Fill our hearts with the weight and the light that leads us on to Christ. We give you thanks for it now. We ask your blessing on 
us as we go our various ways and on the service to follow. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.